Thank you so much, and I'm very honored uh, with the distance that some of you came today to be here. Uh, my name's Chuck Marone. I'm the president of an organization called Strong Towns. Uh, back in 2008, I started to write a blog, and I was, I was uh, dismayed, bewildered, uh, kind of frustrated uh, with uh, not only the conversation that was going on in our country at the time. If you remember, we had banks failing. Uh, we had uh, gas prices spiking. Uh, we had housing you know, crash. We had all this stuff going on. We had this crazy election cycle uh, that you know, now looks so quaint. But at the time, <laughs> it, was, it was kind of nutty. And I remember thinking, uh, nobody's talking about the things that I think are important. And beyond that, there's this whole thing that I'm experiencing where I'm working with all these cities, these cities that are growing really fast, that are making all these investments, uh, that are borrowing money for their future growth, yet they're all going broke. And you can step back and, and see it. Uh, they're putting off maintenance projects that they've got. Uh, they've got these huge backlogs of roads and pipe that they need to fix. They're turning off street lights overnight to save you know, a few dimes here and there, uh, not maintaining their parks, closing the library early. Th these, these are not things that prosperous places do. Yet I was in the business of essentially generating prosperity. I was part of the engineering and planning in these cities that were making all these investments, building all this stuff, permitting all this new growth. And the idea behind all of it was that we would all be better off. Yet clearly, the more we did, the harder things became. And so not really having an answer, but having a lot of questions, in 2008, I started to write. And I was really writing for some of my friends and colleagues, fellow engineers, fellow planners. Uh, I was very shocked when my stuff started to get passed around and picked up in many, many places. And after uh, a year, a couple of colleagues of mine came to me and said, you know, this stuff is really important. Uh, we think you should start a nonprofit. Uh, at the time, I was running my own planning company, uh, which, if you can think of the business climate in 2009, uh, was more than a challenge, right? We were laying off people. We were struggling. I said, I don't have time to do this. You know, this blog is my therapy. Uh, I don't want to run a nonprofit. And so they said, just keep writing. We'll file the paperwork. Uh, we'll get things going. So a year later, we had a 501c3. And a couple months after that, a foundation called me and said, Chuck, uh, come up and tell us what you do. <laughs> I said, I, I don't know what I do, right? <laughs> I just write. And I, I, I went up and I gave them uh, basically the first version of the presentation we're going to go through today. Uh, here's what I see as the problem, and here's what I see as things we can do. And they said, wow, this is a really important message. We want you to go share this with as many people as you can. And they gave me actually three years of startup money for me to leave the planning company I, was, I owned and was running and follow this. Uh, since then, uh, our organization has grown. We are no longer a blog. We're a full media organization. We are about sharing this message with as many people as we can. We publish content multiple times a day. Uh, we go around the country doing talks and presentations like this. We will reach over a million people this year alone and uh, have uh, approaching 2,000 members around the world. Uh, what we're going to try to do today is answer the question, why are our cities struggling financially? Why, despite all the growth and the investment and the job creation, do we struggle to do basic things? And then once we have a, a grasp of that, we're going to start having a, a, another conversation about how we think about things and do things differently. Uh, there are a lot of doers in this room. And I'm going to pre-warn you, you may be frustrated with me at the end because I don't have a five-point plan for you. A big part of the Strong Towns approach is that you have to actually think. You actually have to take ideas and, and, and think about how they apply to your place. Uh, but if you follow along with me, uh, I think at the end of the day, you'll feel very empowered about how to look at your place differently and, and how you have the tools to build real enduring prosperity in the cities you come from. We have a long 
block this morning. Uh, I've got a sh much shorter block this afternoon. I've added a little bit to the presentation, but I also don't want to necessarily stand up here and, and talk at you for three hours. So as we go here, I'll try to take a little break maybe in the middle, but as we go, uh, let's make this a conversation. And if you have a question or something, go ahead. Uh, we're all nice Midwesterners, so we're not going to be shouting at each other. Um, if it's not a good time for questions, I'll, I'll flag you off. Uh, sometimes I get in the middle of a, of, a, of a series of things that have to go together. Uh, if that's the case, I'll wave you off, and then we'll come back to it as soon as I can. Uh, but feel free as we go uh, to make this a little, it's a, it's a nice, cozy room. We can be friends here. Our mission is to support a model of development that allows our cities, towns, and neighborhoods to become financially strong and resilient. Uh, our website, strongtowns.org, I'll give you that at the end. If you're active on social media, you'll find us there. We're doing everything we can to try to expand this conversation. And really, our goal is to change the culture around growth and development and public investments. Uh, we're not trying to get a specific agenda passed. We don't have a five-point plan. We're trying to change the cultural conversation about how we make public investments. I want you to think about the way we built cities thousands of years ago. These are two artist renderings. The one on the left is an ancient city called Ur, Fertile Crescent, 4000 BC. The one on the right, of course, is ancient Rome. If we think about these places, uh, we can quickly understand that they were built around the dominant transportation technology of the day, that of course being what? Yeah, your two feet, right? <laughs> People walked everywhere they went. So the scale, the spacing, the distance between different types of things you would do on a normal day, all this was scaled around a society of people who walked. We can fast forward thousands of years. This is my hometown. I come from Brainerd, Minnesota. I drove down last night after a meeting that I had. Uh, I know many of you have probably been to central Minnesota. This is what my hometown looked like in 1904. People would arrive by train, they would arrive by stagecoach, but once they got there, uh, they would walk everywhere they went. And so again, the scale, the spacing, the distance between different types of things you would do on a normal day, all this was built around a society of people who walked. Beginning in the early 1900s, and then accelerating after World War II, we began to build cities around a different transportation technology. Right? We began to build cities around the automobile. We came up with different building types, different building styles, different ways of arranging things on the landscape. If we were to go out and ask people to explain this transition, they would likely talk about it in terms of progress. We used to be a society of people who walked, so we built cities around people who walked. Now we are a society of people who drive, so we build cities around people who drive. Someday we will have jet cars, and we will build cities around people in jet cars. And someday we will have Star Trek teleportation, and our cities will look completely different than they do today. This is a very affirming way to look at it. It's very comforting for us, because it puts the changes that we see around us on this continuum of things continually getting better. There's another way to look at this, however, that isn't quite as affirming. And I want to put this idea in the back of your head as kind of a backdrop to the entire conversation we're going to have today. When we look at even ancient Ur, <clears throat> we see a, a development pattern uh, that didn't just appear out of nowhere. Uh, humans had been building cities for thousands of years before you get to Ur. Ur is just the first one that survived long enough for us to dig it up, right? The knowledge for doing this came through trial and error experimentation. People tried things. What worked, they would expand upon. What didn't work, those people often died, went away. Those ideas weren't transmitted to the next generation. People built cities that had to endure times of plenty, times of scarcity, times of conflict, times of peace. And over many, many thousands of years, through trial and error, they kind of figured out a way to do it. By the time you get to ancient Rome, you had a process for assembling places to live in 
that had been honed and refined by trial and error over many, many millennia. And by the time you get to my hometown in the early 1900s, you have an approach that is essentially universal. We can go around the world and look at cities everywhere. And even though they will have different architectural styles, they'll have different building materials, the essential layout and design and spacing is all very familiar. An approach based on trial and error. When we look at this approach, I remember back in my early days, uh, I would ask questions. And the response I got was, well, Chuck, that's the way things have always been done. <laughs> It's important to know that you know, this isn't the way things have always been done. right? This is very, very new. These ideas didn't come from trial and error experimentation. They largely came from where? <laughs> Universities, European intellectuals, you know, the concept of hierarchical road networks, modern zoning, modern finance. All these were new ideas we had that we just took and implemented everywhere all at once. We didn't try this out in, I was going to say, who do we pick on here? We didn't try this out in Iowa, right? For a couple hundred years, see what worked, take the best ideas and bring them here to Wisconsin. Right? We just decided to build this way across an entire continent, all in a generation. It is important for us to realize that we are living in one of the greatest experiments that's ever been attempted. No human civilization has ever reshaped an entire continent around a brand new set of ideas all within a very short period of time. We are living in an unknown state. No society has ever done what we've done. What I want to talk about today are some of the financial ramifications of this, things that weren't apparent to people when they first started down this path, uh, but now is becoming too obvious for us to avoid talking about any further. In the early days of Strong Towns, uh, one of the things that I did uh, that um, I think people found rather novel was to go out and look at actual developments and try to figure out the return on investment. What's the cash flow situation from these different development styles? One of the things that uh, economic development people, uh, engineers, planners tend to believe is something that we have started to call the quantum theory of economic development. The quantum theory of economic development goes something like this. Uh, we know that this project doesn't make a lot of financial sense. We know that this project doesn't make a lot of financial sense. We know that this project doesn't make a lot of financial sense. But when they're combined together into this larger whole called the city, all of a sudden, the, the finances make great sense. And they all build on each other. And there's all these great effects that we see. My response to that has always been, you know, how's that working for you? Um, but from a more technical standpoint, if that theory is true, there are actually parts of the system that in a sheer accounting standpoint should be massively profitable. They are the places where it, it, when you're looking at revenues and expenses, which accountants call profit or loss, uh, you should be very, very profitable. For example, this is a dead-end cul-de-sac. Uh, this is the kind of... Uh, Development we see all over the place, a dead end, residential homes, no through traffic, no commercial traffic. The only reason this road exists is because there's houses on it. If those houses weren't there, no road. This was built in the mid-1990s. When it was built, the city had a policy that said, uh, we will pay for half the paving if the property owners will pay for the other half. So we asked the question, all right, based on the tax receipts that the city is collecting from the people that live within this development, how long is it going to take the city to recoup the half that they invested in paving this road? Uh, the answer is 37 years. Now, the road won't last 37 years. During that time period, the residents are also paying taxes to the city. Why? Because they have an anticipation that the city will go out when the road falls apart and actually fix it. But it's going to take 37 years for the city just to recoup their initial investment Where's the money going to come from to actually fix the road? Here's another development. This one is a closed loop system, dead end cul-de-sac. Again, no through traffic, no commercial traffic, uh, just residential homes. In the early 1980s, a developer came in and built this subdivision. 
The developer paid for all the utilities, paid for all the roads, uh, rolled that into the cost of the homes when they were sold. Uh, residents have been paying that cost on their mortgages all these years. Uh, they have been also paying taxes to the city for the maintenance of the roadway. The roadway has now fallen apart. The city went out to fix it. The cost, $354,000. We asked the question, based on the revenue the city's collecting from the people who live here, the only people who really use this road in any substantive way, how long will it take them to recoup the money they just spent to fix it? The answer is 79 years. Now, the road won't last anywhere near that long, right? So we asked the question, if the city wanted to collect enough cash from these people between now and the time the road fell apart to actually have the money to fix the road, what would that mean? It would mean an immediate 46% increase in taxes with annual increases of 3% over inflation every year for the next 25 years with all that money going just to maintain the roadway. The sewer, the water, the storm sewer, vastly more expensive uh, propositions. Sometimes people say, OK, Chuck, uh, we get it. We know we lose money on residential development. We make it up on commercial. Commercial is, in a sense, our cash cow. Uh, my response to that is always, I, I don't know any corporation uh, that loses money on 90% of what it does and then tries to make it up on the last 10%. I don't know why an incorporated municipality would find that to be a good strategy. I think a lot of uh, corporate municipalities that have followed that strategy are having second doubts now that the retail sector is imploding around us. Uh, nonetheless, there's this notion that we don't really have to worry about residential. All we have to worry about is our commercial. This is a business park. This is a kind of build it and they will come investments that cities like to do to generate jobs and growth and tax base. Uh, this was built in the mid-1990s. It's completely developed. Every single lot is built. The city felt this was such a successful project that they want to build the same exact thing right next door. They just want to mirror this and build the same thing. We said, perfect. If we could build the same thing and get the same level of investment, would this be a good project? The cost in today's dollars, so this is inflation adjusted from the mid-90s, would be 2.1 million. We can go out and measure there's 6.6 .6 million of taxable value out there in this park. Now, pause for a second. Of that 6.6 .6 million, four of those lots are church. <laughs> Two of the lots belong to the school district. It's a bus maintenance building. Uh, one of the lots is a county maintenance facility. One of the lots is a city maintenance facility. These are all very important things in a community, right? We need churches. We need schools. We need maintenance buildings. Very important. But none of them pay taxes to the city, right? Of the remaining lots, the ones that theoretically would pay taxes, Every single one was given a long-term tax subsidy in order to attract them to move into this park. For the sake of our analysis, we had to assume uh, that in this new park, every single lot would be developed within 12 months by a full tax-paying, non-subsidized entity, and that every single penny of revenue coming in would go to retire that bond. If that were the case, it would still take the city almost three decades 29 years just to break even. That's 29 years where everybody else's taxes would need to go up to pay to plow the snow, mow the ditches, provide police protection, fire protection, and every other service that is needed. And that's in the most wildly optimistic scenario. When I first gave the presentation to the foundation, uh, I had like 15 of these. <laughs> and in the early days of going out, I, I did a whole bunch of these. And I found I can make the point in just three. You go more than that, and people start to cry. And <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't go well. Um, if you're someone who likes case studies, and th this kind of data like, really means a lot to you, uh, on our website, there's a bunch of these. You can go and, and dig them up. Um, but let me, let me walk you through what is going on. And I will apologize. I'm an engineer. I like charts and graphs. Uh, it's a flaw, I know. Um, there's four charts in this presentation, the next four slides. I will walk you through them. If you're not a chart person, I promise it won't be too painful. Once we get done with these, no more charts, OK? 
let's say that a developer comes to town. So I have a piece of property I would like to build upon. Uh, I will, at my expense, build all the residential homes, all the commercial buildings. I will, to your standards, put in the roads and the streets and the curb and the sidewalk, the pipes, the pumps, the valves, the meters. I'll, I'll do all that. I'll, I'll pay for it. I'm not asking for any variances from your codes. I'm not asking for any tax subsidies. I'm not asking for any handouts. The only thing that I'm asking as a developer is that when I finish making this huge investment in your community, that you, the city, the taxpayer, agree that you will take over the long-term responsibility of serving and maintaining this stuff. What would we say? We'd say, fantastic, right? You're here, you, you're following all of our rules. You're building everything. You're asking for no handouts, no subsidies, nothing. This is the ideal scenario, right? This is, this is perfect. But let's say, you know, we're smart Wisconsinites. We're, we're, we've heard of the strong town stuff. We're good, prudent people. Uh, what we're going to do is when the money from this new development comes in, we're going to take the portion that would normally get spent in other parts of the city fixing and repairing stuff, and we're going to set that aside. And every year when that money comes in, we're going to set that portion aside and we're going to allow it to accumulate so that when we get out a generation and we have to make good on this promise we made when we did this development that we'll take care of all this stuff, we'll have a pot of money there to do it. This is what that looks like. In year one, everything is brand new, hasn't cost you anything. The money comes in, you take that portion, and you set it aside. In year two, more money comes in, you add to what you had in year one. In year three, you add a little bit more, in year four, a little bit more. And you can see a five-year-old road isn't costing you anything. A 10-year-old sidewalk isn't costing you anything. A 15-year-old pipe isn't costing you anything. And so for a couple of decades, you're just accumulating money with no outflows. You're feeling very, very rich. This is working out really well for you. And when you get you know, 20, 20 years, 20 plus years out, you've got a big pot of money there. The problem comes in, in, in this example, year 25, when we have to make good on that promise we made way back in year one. What we find is that the cumulative amount of money we brought in is insufficient. And from a, tax, uh, from a cash flow standpoint, we run far into the negative. Now, cities aren't one development, right? Cities are a collection of developments. They're a series of neighborhoods. So let's say that our developer comes back in a couple years later. Says, you know, that, that worked out really well for you, worked out really well for me. I would like to do a similar size development. And every other year from this point forward, a developer walks in the door with a proposal to do a similar size development. In other words, nice, steady, consistent growth. The ideal scenario that we would all love. And we take the money and we set it aside and we save it for the day when we have to make good on all these promises we're making as we grow. Here's what that looks like. In year one, you've got your first development. It will pay in the entire 25 years shown here. In year three, you add a second. In year five, in year seven, and you can see not only are we having no expenses and just a lot of growth, but the growth kind of starts to compound. We're having growth upon growth upon growth. Your cash starts to accelerate upwards. And when we get to year 25, the year we have to make good on that very first promise we made back in year one, yeah, you've got to spend a little bit of money, but it's not a big deal, right? You've had all this growth. The growth creates what we call the illusion of wealth. Because as we all intuitively understand, if you lose money on every transaction, you don't make it up in volume. If you lose money over the long term on every project you do, the further you go out in time, the more downward pressure there is on your budget. This is the answer to that question. Why are cities struggling financially? Why, despite all the growth and the job creation and our just general prosperity, do we not have the money to do anything? Why are we struggling? It's not because cities are incompetent. It's not because we're not taxing enough. 
It's not because, you know, go to your crazy, you know, left and right paradigm. It's not any of those reasons. It's because we are living way out here now. And we have accumulated during this part lots and lots of promises. Now let me ask you a, a couple of questions. Do you see yourself in this chart here? Do you recognize your own behavior? Th this, is, this is a human flaw. This is, a, this is a flaw that we all, this is why people smoke, right? This is why you will uh, go home tonight and sit in front of the TV and have a bowl of ice cream instead of going for a jog, right? Like, oh, this ice cream is really good. I like this TV show. Uh-oh, heart disease, right? <laughs> this is the way we're wired as humans. We are wired. It's called temporal discounting from a psychology standpoint. We are wired to highly value positive feedback today and to deeply, deeply discount, in our minds, negative feedback in the future. That's how we're wired. That is a human flaw. Here's a second question for you. What happened to the society thousands of years ago that built their economic and development approach around the exploitation of this human flaw? What happened to them? They went away. Yeah. The, their, their society does not exist. Those ideas were not transmitted on to the next generation. We're in an unknown space today. We have created a development approach, uh, an approach to building and growth that exploits this human weakness. And we now find ourselves way, way, way out here. And so we have to, in a sense, fight our own impulse. I'm going to show you one more chart. It's more depressing than this one. Uh, so I apologize in advance. Uh, but then we'll be done with charts. But this is one that we have to uh, look at and understand. And this is a, a chart of debt. Everybody in this room knows uh, the conversation we're having about our national debt, right? Uh, $20 trillion, it's an insane amount of money. It's, it's an unfathomable sum. I remember when I was in fourth grade and we had the weekly reader. You guys have weekly readers when you were kids. Uh, there was a little breakout box. It said, uh, if you were to take the national debt and convert it into dollar bills and stack them on top of each other, they would go to the moon and back. 20 sometimes, right? As if for a fourth grader, replacing one abstract concept with another abstract concept <laughs> would clarify things, right? These numbers are so big that we cannot comprehend them. And this chart here, the bottom line, the blue one, that's the growth in our public sector debt since World War II. That's the huge, unfathomable number. The black one right above it, that's the growth in our GDP. This green one, the one that soars up like this, that's private sector debt. That's debt that we share. That's home mortgages, commercial real estate loans, auto loans, credit cards, margin interest accounts, student loans, private sector debt. The way we built the first generation of this new experimental way of, of creating prosperity in America is that we took our savings and we reinvested the illusion of wealth to create the growth. After one generation, after one life cycle of this, things started to bog down. Think mid-70s, early 80s, right? We had made all these promises that we now had to make good on. We started to accumulate all these things that we needed to do. We had to go back and fix stuff. But we needed the growth. So what did we do? It took us a while to figure it out. But we eventually shifted from an economic model based on growth through savings and investment to an economic model based on growth through debt accumulation. And growth through debt accumulation became such an important part of keeping this all going 
that as we cross into the third generation of this approach, we actually allowed it to become predatory. We needed the growth so bad, we actually allowed our financial system to prey on our friends and neighbors. You can't afford a house? Well, now you can. You can afford a small house? Nope. Now you can afford a large house. You can afford a large house? Well, now you can afford multiple large homes. Our ability to continue this experiment based on our friends and neighbors taking on accelerating levels of debt is simply not there. Obviously, there's some huge implications to all this. The way we have become used to growing is waning. The federal government, the state government does not have the money to come and bail out every city that is in financial distress. The state DOTs, which have been for a long time the, the, the purveyors of growth, will go build something and then growth will happen. Your state DOT is so bankrupt, is so functionally insolvent, it, it's bizarre to even consider that they would build another mile of anything. When you line up all the promises they have made of stuff they will take care of, and you compare that to any potential revenue source they'll have, there is a massive gap that will not be filled. To build anything else in the state is reckless. The private sector is tapped out. We do not have the ability uh, to take on accelerating levels of debt. Young people getting out of college that are expected to buy the homes of retirees when they downsize are so overburdened with debt that they will not be able to make any purchase like that for two decades. What this means is that at the local level, we are going to be forced to absorb the costs of our development pattern. If we want that road fixed, we are going to have to pay for it. If we want that pipe repaired, that money is going to have to come from us. This can't be done in the current pattern of development without some incredibly large tax increases and or some devastatingly large cuts in services. Now, I wasn't invited here to tell you what you already know, right? I think many people in this room, maybe most people, uh, work directly for or closely with a government. If you don't, you certainly uh, read the news. This is the debate we're having everywhere, right? Every level of government, everywhere around the country. How big is the tax increase going to be? Who's going to pay for it? How deep is the service cut going to be? And where is that going to be felt? It's critical, sitting here today, that we see the third variable in this sentence, the current pattern of development. As long as we continue to build in an approach that is functionally insolvent, there's no way that our cities are going to avoid insolvency. As long as we continue to build in a way that gives us an illusion of wealth today in exchange for enormous long-term liabilities, there's no way that our cities are going to avoid default. Whether that's a hard default, like we see in places like Detroit and Stockton and San Bernardino and now potentially Dallas, or whether it's a soft default, like we see in thousands of cities where they lay off public safety employees, they limit library hours, they shut off streetlights overnight, they don't maintain the parks, they put off critical maintenance because they just don't have the money. We have to start having a conversation about how we build places that are financially productive. So what do we do? Uh, very early in Strongtown's history, I uh, was able to put together, we, we as a team were able to put together a, uh, a tour of California. And I started in north, north of Sacramento uh, in a town called Redding and ended up in San Diego. So for those of you that know your California geography, that is a long trip. Uh, we did that in a week. We slept on couches. Uh, we ate lots of In-N-Out burgers. Uh, we survived, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, barely. Um, but we delivered this talk to hundreds of people across California uh, in many, many different places. And I kept getting the same feedback. We get to the end. And the Californians uh, would say to me, Chuck, and, and understand that I had for a couple years been doing this in the Midwest. So this is my first trip kind of outside of friendly territory. And they kept, they had a, a unique reaction. They kept saying, Chuck, um, we're really angry with you. Uh, you've come here. You said the sky is falling. 
You scared the heck out of us, but you didn't give us the solution. What is the solution to these problems? And it, it was frustrating for me because I thought that I was talking about the ways we do things differently. But they kept asking for a solution. What's the solution? And it finally occurred to me what they were asking. What they were asking was something slightly different than what I was hearing. I was hearing, what is the solution? And what they were really asking was this. What can someone else change about what they're doing so that I don't have to change anything about what I'm doing? Also very cultural. Yeah. At Strong Towns, we, we just tell you that, that there is no solution to the problems I've just laid out. Um, there's a saying that goes, problems have solutions. Uh, predicaments have outcomes. Uh, we've passed the problem phase, and we're now in the predicament phase. There are outcomes here that we're going to have to deal with. And so as an organization, as a movement, uh, what we like to talk about are rational responses. How do we, as thoughtful people, working together within a community, look at this broad set of challenges we face, roll up our sleeves, and respond as rational people? And when we start to talk about rational responses, I always go back to this photo here. This is my hometown again, back in 1904. And I have to tell you, when I first saw this photo, I was blown away. I couldn't believe this was my hometown. Um, I'm a planner. I look at this. I look at the way the buildings line up perfectly, the way they frame the public realm at just the right Greco-Roman ratios, right? The, there's good segmentation of the space. The buildings have great symmetry. They front the public street in a, just a perfect way. This is an exquisitely designed street. Let me ask you a few questions about these people here. How thick was their zoning code? Yeah. How many boards and committees did someone have to go to to get approval to build in this city? How much tax subsidy did they give out? How many shovel-ready sites did they have? How many federal and state grants did they receive? How many engineers and planners and economic development advisors did they hire to put this together for them? We can go through the litany of things that we have convinced ourselves are absolutely essential to building a place. They had none of them. They didn't have 30-year mortgages. These were a bunch of illiterate lumberjacks in the middle of nowhere. Look at what they built. How do they do this? It's really simple. They copied what they knew worked. They took the materials they had on hand, and they built in a style and an approach that they had seen work for thousands and thousands of years. After 70 years of uh, all of our pro-growth policies, our new zoning code, our new planning process, all the engineers and planners, all the grants and tax subsidies and investments that we've made. Here's what this exact same street now looks like. Yeah, that's the proper reaction. It's a, it's a half, you know, it's a wasteland of half occupied buildings and empty parking lots. And if you want to grasp in one photo why our cities struggle financially, understand there's a half million dollars of public infrastructure and that stretch of street right there. Where is the wealth that is going to take care of that generation after generation after generation? I was giving a talk at a university in Boise, Idaho. And I showed this picture. And a student raised their hand, stood up, said, Chuck, um, I'm from Costa Rica. Costa Rica is a very poor country. We can't afford to build the way that you build here. Uh, when we build, we have to build one block at a time. And before we can build the next block, we have to make sure that every gap is filled in in the block we just built. Otherwise, we won't be able to afford it. We're a very poor country. We can't afford to build this way. We're a very poor country now, too, right? We can't afford to build this way either. And for a long period of time, that illusion of wealth made us think that this kind of thing didn't matter that we could have huge gaps between buildings. We could run pipe all over the place. We could give away all kinds of money to chase growth. We have to start thinking differently. 
So how do we do that? The first thing we need to do is get rid of the worst of our habits. Build it and they will come is a fantastic movie plot, right? It's got everything, right? It is a horrible economic development strategy. We are in what at Strong Towns we call the desperation phase of this suburban experiment. We are so desperate for growth that we're willing to do absolutely ridiculous things, things that we wouldn't have pondered even 20 years ago, right? We're willing to run millions of dollars to build shovel-ready sites in the off chance that you know, Google will come trolling through town looking for a place to go. We have teams of people ready to hand out subsidies to anyone who even sniffs at coming to town. I have seen cities where they weren't even asking for subsidies, and people walked in the door, and they like force-fed them subsidies. This is not how cities build wealth. And this is not how cities have ever built wealth. I am going to show you right now the very simple way that cities build wealth. Do any of you recognize this city here? Does this look familiar to any of you? If I said it was lacrosse, would that freak you out? Lacrosse looked like that at some point, right? There's probably a picture in your historical society of the city just like that. If I said this was Eau Claire, would, would that surprise you? No. Why? Because at one point in your past, it looked like that here, right? If I said Minneapolis or Milwaukee or Chicago, they all started just like that, right? Some pop-up shacks, some hopes and some dreams. The trees are wrong, but, you know, this could be Dallas, could be Kansas City, could be San Francisco or Vancouver. If you went back, it could be Boston uh, or, you know, it, it, it could be uh, Manhattan. Manhattan started just like this, right? At one point, there was just a series of little pop-up shacks and eventually became Manhattan. You can go back far enough in history and, you know, this is how Rome started. London, Paris, this could be Romulus and Remus standing out here, right? I'm going to emphasize this point for you because I actually think that what I'm going to say next is the most important and difficult thing that we're going to talk about. Uh, and I, I rarely, I, I think few people rarely grasp it because I go through it and I just like hear it. But I want you to actually, we're going to pause here and think about this because we have the time this morning. In this country, we built thousands of places like this. And for a variety of complex reasons, reasons that defy our ability to predict, our ability to project, or our ability to even fully comprehend after the fact, a lot of these places failed. When they failed, what happened? Did the stock market crash? Did unemployment skyrocket? Did we have to have an emergency session of Congress to bail out Wall Street? No. A few people lost a little bit of money, they salvaged what they could, and they moved on to the next place. We built thousands of these across this country. And for a variety of complex reasons, reasons that defy our ability to predict, defy our ability to project, and defy our ability to even explain after the fact. A lot of these places were successful. And when they were successful, they would grow in a very simple to understand way. They would grow incrementally up, incrementally out, and become incrementally more intense. And so after 30 years of incremental growth, this would become, this is my hometown in 1870. This is the exact same street that would later become this. And after another 40 years of incrementally growing up, incrementally growing out, and incrementally becoming more intense, these two and three story wood structures would become buildings of brick and granite. The way we build wealth is not by going to the casino and putting it all on red. The way we build wealth is by making small investments over a broad area over a long period of time. Now, I'm going to pause here, and, and I want to go back and, and, and 
focus on a couple words. I said we built thousands of these across this country. And for a variety of complex, I want to focus on that word, reasons. Reasons that defy our ability to project, our ability to even comprehend after the fact. That concept is such a hard one for us. And I include myself in this. As engineers, we're taught, here's how you project future traffic demand. As, as planners, we're taught, here's how you uh, project future absorption rates. As economic development people, we're taught to, here's how you project uh, what's going to happen after you make this investment and build this project. And I think the thing that we get wrong so often, just at like a base level, is that we are terrible at projecting. We cannot do this. And when we look at our projections, and we look at them honestly, what we realize is that they're merely justifications for actions we want to take. If we're honest with ourselves, that's what they are. When you can acknowledge, and I'll, I'll give you a couple uh, books to reference if you're interested in this line of thinking. Uh, there's a, a gentleman named Nassim Taleb. He wrote a book called Fool by Randomness, but don't read that. It's indecipherable. Um, <laughs> he wrote another book called The Black Swan, which I think is really, really important. But if you're only going to read one of his books, read the third book, which is called Anti-Fragile. And in this, he discusses uh, systems where you cannot uh, project what is going to happen. Complex systems. And complex systems, I think it's important. Um, and and we're, we're surrounded by this you know, economic model that assumes that really smart people you know, in an ivory tower can predict what the economy will be like, not just six months from now, but 30 years from now. Th th that is insane. Um, but even at the local level, we're caught up in the same kind of sense. Uh, there's, a, there's a huge difference between systems that are complex and systems that are merely complicated. A Swiss watch is really complicated, OK? It has a lot of parts. It's very intricate. If you start messing around with it, you're going to screw it up. It's very complicated. But it is not complex. What's the difference? A complex system has the ability to receive feedback in the individual components and adapt. Cities, we try to treat as if they're complicated. Engineers would like to make them complicated. Planners would like to make them complicated when in fact, they're very, very complex. We do something, and what happens? People adapt to it. They change their minds. They do things differently than what we had thought they would. We react to that, and what happens? People react in different ways. Cities are complex. And once we recognize that cities are complex, and traffic is complex, and water demand is complex, and all these systems that we try to treat as complicated are actually complex, the first thing it does is it humbles us to realize that we really don't know what's going on. We might think we do, and sometimes we project, and sometimes it works out the way we did, but a lot of times it doesn't. And when it doesn't, we'll you know, have a backstory for why something happened that was unpredictable, right? But the fact that things are unpredictable is exactly the point. When we look at the way people built cities of the past, the major thing that was different is that they didn't assume they knew anything about the future. They made little bets, and things reacted. And then they made more little bets, and things reacted. And they made more little bets, and things reacted. And eventually, you make enough little bets, you get to the Roman Colosseum, right? It's interesting because today in America, we're so wealthy, and we're so confident in our ability to do things, uh, that we actually go out and build the Roman Colosseum because we believe it's going to create all kinds of other things. When you look historically at cities, those kind of investments would be the culmination of other things. 
it's very hard for us, especially in the public sector, because we come to you as leaders or experts, and then we give you basically the tools to blow the place up. That's a really, really difficult combination. It is hard to be the public official who stands up and says, I don't know what traffic will be in 20 years. I don't know what's going to happen to this block. I don't know what the future of this building site will be. That is really hard for us to do. Yet, if we can start to do that and start to have a mindset premised around the idea that we don't know, what we find is that our actions become very different. We become less worried about getting something done efficiently and more worried about the ability of something to adapt and be flexible and change over time. And when you look at traditional development patterns, the hallmark of them is their adaptability, their flexibility, the ability to change as complex systems adapt and change around them. That's the longest explanation of those three slides I've ever given. But I, I hope that was valuable. It, it, is, it is such a hard concept because we are not wired this way. We are not wired this way. Especially in America today, where we are used to solving all problems with just more money. Um, let me show you how powerful this incremental approach is, OK? These are two identical blocks in my hometown. Uh, the one on the left I've labeled old and blighted. The one on the right I've labeled shiny and new. If you look at them, you'll see they're the same size. They're on the same thoroughfare, the same neighborhood. Everything about them is the same, except for the style of development that's on them. That old and blighted block looks like this. As my city was growing incrementally, uh, the next increment of out were these three blocks. So in the 1920s, uh, they built this, which is essentially like the cheapest commercial property you were going to build in the 1920s. And, and let, me, let me go back a couple slides just to uh, make sure that we're all on the same page here. You see these pop-up shacks here, right? And then this same exact street 30 years later is this. But I want you to think in your minds, what you're not seeing here is stuff two or three blocks this way, or two or three blocks this way. What did that stuff look like at this time? It looked like this. Remember, I said the city grew incrementally up, incrementally out, and became incrementally more intense. So when you transition from that to this, out on the edge is where you have your pop-up shacks now. And when we transition to this, those pop-up shacks would have been converted into slightly more intense buildings, two and three story. And on the edge of that would have been your pop-up shacks. So when you look at this photo here, what you're looking at is the 1920s version of the pop-up shack on the edge of town. That's what this is. And had things continued as they had for thousands of years, what would we have seen happen here? Over time, it, this property would have, this land would have become more valuable as the city continued to grow. Uh, you would have gotten second, third stories. It would have become more ornate. But that's not what happened, right? These were built in the 1920s. Then we had the Depression. We had World War II. We had a completely new style of development that just skipped right over this and started building out on the edge. These blocks have stagnated for 90 years. Two blocks over used to look just like this. The city labeled it blight, had it torn down, and now we have the new Taco John's drive through Everybody was thrilled about this, right? We got rid of blight. We got a brand new, nice looking building. It meets the sign code. It meets the parking code. It meets the floor area ratios. It's got two drive through lanes. We've got uh, native plants in the stormwater area, so the environmental people were happy. The bike walk people were happy because they got them to put in a sidewalk. The sidewalk ends right here, but it, you know. <laughs> Here's what nobody bothered to look at. That old blighted rundown block has a total value when this was done of $1.1 million. 
that shiny and new block, the same size area, the same amount of public infrastructure, the same everything, just a different building style, has a total value of only 800,000. The city is actually collecting 42% more taxes from that old, junky, rundown block than they are the brand new. Understand what you're looking at. You're looking at the traditional pattern of development. The way we built places for thousands of years around the world, slowly and incrementally, you're looking at that in its infant form after 90 years of neglect, and it still outperforms by a wide, wide margin the stuff we build brand new today. And everybody in this room understands the trajectory of the taco joint, right? 20 years from now, what is that taco John's going to be? It's going to be a used car lot, right? 10 years later, it will be boarded up. We'll be trying to get a grant to get it torn down, right? We've all seen this in our communities. In fact, uh, in the two years after this was done, here's what's happened to the, uh, the property values of these blocks. The city now collects 78% more taxes on that old and blighted block than the shiny and new. Let's say we walk out of this room today and we realize that what our cities need more than anything is not growth. We've had tons of growth. What we need is productive growth. We actually need growth that generates more wealth and prosperity uh, than it creates in long-term expense and liability. And the easiest way for us to do that is to take the existing stuff we have and get more out of it, right? If you have a business that's losing money and you can generate more revenue without generating more costs, that's how you solve that problem, right? The other way to solve that problem is to cut your costs. <laughs> From a city, when you've got pipe in the ground and sidewalk in the ground, and street, that's a harder proposition. It's going to be part of our conversation, but it's a harder proposition. But it, let's say we realize that what we need to do on blocks like this is actually take the tax base that is there and without increasing our cost, we have to make those properties more valuable. We don't have a lot of money. We can't go tell people what to do with their property. We have to work with them. Tell me, and this is the, uh, let's, let's have some interaction here. Tell me some of the things that you would do on this block to make it more valuable than what it is today? What are some of the things that you'd try? Plant trees. Plant trees. I, it's very interesting because the, the sun comes from this way, these face south, and these businesses put up hefty bags and stuff in the windows because <laughs> the sun is so bright. Um, some shade trees along here would aesthetically be nice and also functionally serve a real purpose. Please. You know what, a little bit of paint <laughs> we'll go a long ways in here. But yeah, if we could fix up the facade somehow and make it look a little bit better. Go ahead. Please. It's got a wide sidewalk. You could have an outdoor sitting area. You know what? Uh, some planters, some benches, some seating outside. I think you'd also, uh, I'm going to interject something here. Uh, I think slowing the traffic down through here, giving these people who would actually park here a chance. It's 45 through here. It's really fast. So it's date. I think slowing down the traffic for just a couple blocks there would make outdoor seating a lot nicer and make it a lot safer. Please. Go ahead. I see a bicycle tipped over on the sidewalk. <laughs> It'd be nice to have a bike rack. There's no bike racks there. Uh, in fact, um, you can't really tell in this photo, but uh, the city, as they've improved the streets, have taken out the sidewalks and then kind of widen them out. And so it's actually really hard to walk and bike here. Even though there's a whole neighborhood with you know, 3,000 people that live in it, uh, most of them would never walk to this place. They would get in their car and drive. And because they get in their car, it's just as easy to go to the Starbucks you know, drive through than it is here. So I, I think the bike rack as an overall strategy to kind of make the neighborhood a little more walkable, perfect. Keep going. Please. A second story. It's interesting because these properties are zoned commercial. You're not actually allowed to do anything, but you could build a second story, but it'd have to be commercial. And then it would have to be sprinkled, and it would have to have an elevator, and it have to have all these things. Um, change in the code that would allow a second story to be residential 
uh, would actually give you a lot of flexibility to, at, at lower cost, make better use of, of this property. And really, that's kind of traditionally how these things were built anyway. Please. Just a comment. I think that's interesting. Your picture from 1904, when you look at those, there was, it appeared to me that there were businesses on the first floor and residential on the second. Is that true? Yes. Very common. And, and if you think about, I'm glad you brought this up. Because I, 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 I want you to think, let's take this side diversion for a second. I want you to think about um, this idea of bootstrapping, which has become kind of a politically charged term in some senses. Uh, but it's an idea that we nostalgize here in this country, that in America, you can bootstrap your way to success. Well, let's talk about what bootstrapping meant back then. It meant that you would start with a little pop-up shack. And the front part of it would be your store. And the back part of it would be a tiny little house for you and maybe you know your spouse. Uh, and hopefully not a kid, but maybe you would have one or two of them back there too. And if you think about it, I was actually in Pompeii, the ruins of Pompeii once. And there was this exact setup. And what you could see, and I, I, I'm going to say this, and I don't mean it in a sexist way. I just mean it in a historically accurate way. <laughs> in Pompeii, uh, you would have had the man go out and work outside the city walls during the day. And the wife, to supplement their income, would you know, have one eye on the back of the house on the kids and one eye on the front, where it was essentially like their version of fast food. It was three little pots that they would have a fire going underneath and food in. And it would serve food out the front. And so you could essentially do both duties at the same time uh, and supplement your income. So if one day uh, the, you know, the one spouse didn't find work, you had a little bit of income here. If this didn't work well, you had that. You had options. That's how people bootstrap. And if you were successful in that, someday the store would grow and you would build a second story. And if you were successful in that, what would happen? You would build the nicer house in the neighborhood and you would rent that place to the person who worked in your store. Now you're making wealth. Now you're just, now you've made it, right? So you were able to go from nothing to something with your own drive and initiative. Try doing that today. Try doing that today. The, I, the concept of bootstrapping today is a bizarre one. If you want to start, we had, uh, do you guys have Dunkin' Donuts at all? In, OK. We had Dunkin' Donuts come to Minnesota. Uh, two years ago, and it was this huge announcement. And out of curiosity, I checked it out. I'm like, I wonder what it takes to start a Dunkin' Donuts. Do you know what you have to have to be eligible to start a Dunkin' Donuts? You have to have a half million dollar net worth, and your liquid net worth has to be 250000 So you have to have 250000 in cash sitting around. That's not a bootstrapping person, right? So. The ability to uh, use these buildings more flexibly is not in our zoning code today. If it did, we would open up tons of opportunities for people to actually do the thing we nostalgize here in this country, which is to lift themselves up by the bootstraps. Any other ideas for things we would do here? Do you, do you see what we've done? We could, we could go out on the street and we could grab 20 people at random, put them in a room, and say, come up with ideas to make this property better. And after an hour, we'd have 50 ideas. We could go out and we could try them. And trees might work, it might not. Benches might work, it might not. But we got a lot of little things we can try. And if they don't work, we're not really out that much. And if they do work, great. We're, we're, we're just building wealth. Tell me what you would do to make this property more valuable. You don't, have, you, you don't own it. You're not going to buy it. You don't have the money. You can't force them to do things they don't want to do. What would you do there? I, I don't know. I have no idea. There are some really brilliant people working on that problem. Sometimes they call it sprawl retrofit or sprawl repair. If you ever look at those books or those manuals, you will see beautiful architectural renderings of what can be done with a site like this. If you actually take it to a person who would build it, they will tell you it's financially impossible. It will not work without massive, massive subsidies to make it happen. Understand what we have here. 
Here we have a development pattern with very high upside potential and very limited downside potential. Here we have a development pattern with no upside potential and a downside potential that can literally go negative. There is a reason why our ancestors, and I say that in the biggest sense of the word, our ancestors around the world built in this approach. It's the same thing we see on the edge of town. Uh, this is our fleet farm. You, you, you tell me you don't have fleet, you do have fleet farm here. You do, yeah. okay. Brainerd is the home of Mills Fleet Farm. We were the original place. Uh, because of that, we have the biggest one in the world. Uh, double size big box store, auto dealership, gas station. This is a 20 acre lot. It's the most valuable piece of property in the entire area. When these people show up to a meeting, we just stop the meeting and ask them, like, what do you need, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is 20 acres of our core downtown. I understand that the movie Far or the, the TV show Fargo was back on last night. Mm. I've never seen it, but I have friends who are obsessed with it. If you've seen the movie Fargo, you've seen a, a not so flattering but not so inaccurate portrayal of my hometown. Um, for those of you that haven't been there, uh, most of the second and third stories are, are not occupied. We have trouble keeping tenants in the first story. Uh, after 5 o'clock at night, the place just dies, except for a bunch of dive bars. Um, I live about six blocks from here, and I can tell you I'm, I'm downtown maybe once or twice a month, uh, which is wrong. It should be that number a week. It's just there's not a lot to do. When we look at that 20 acres out on the edge, uh, we see a total value of 600000 an acre. It's a huge sum of money. But when we look at that 20 acres in the middle of town, uh, we see a value that is 78% greater. The city collects 78% more property taxes and essentially the equivalent amount of retail taxes from that rundown junkie 20 acres of the downtown versus the brand new big development out on the edge. How much should we spend to get that Mills Fleet Farm? Well, the state spent a couple hundred million on the bypass. Uh, we spent something like 30 million to run sewer and water just out to this spot here. Uh, millions on the frontage roads, the backage roads. When I was an engineer, I actually designed this one. This was 2.6 million for that. How much did my generation pay to get the wealth in that 20 acres downtown? We didn't pay anything, right? That was wealth that my great-great-grandparents and their contemporaries built slowly and incrementally over time and then essentially bequeathed to us as an endowment of sorts, right? And we've kind of slowly melted it down. A building burns down, we convert it into a parking lot. Another building burns down, we make it a parking lot. That's our development. Nothing new has been built there in my lifetime, but lots of new parking lots. What happens when Mills Fleet Farm goes out of business? It will happen at some point. At some point in the future, whether it's five months, five years, 50 years from now, that will not be a Mills Fleet Farm. What comes next? I don't know. But we've seen this in other places, right? Whatever comes next on the economic food chain is going to be lower than what Fleet Farm is. What you're looking at today on this 20 acres is the peak, the peak. Everything is downhill from this point on. There are 134 different properties in the downtown. What happens when one of them loses a tenant? What happens when someone goes out of business? What happens when we figure out in our infinite wisdom that uh, we have uh, too much retail space and not enough office space? or too much office space and not enough residential space. Well, these buildings are highly flexible. They can become many, many different things. If a copy shop doesn't work there, maybe an accountant's office will. If an office doesn't work there, maybe a residence will. There's all kinds of different opportunities. These places can adapt and change along with us. There is a reason people built this way. Let me show you. Um, 
how financially productive this style of building is. Uh, what I'm going to show you right now are some maps that depict value per acre. If, if you think of a farmer going out and spreading seed across a field, the parts of the field that grow the most robustly, we would say that's the most productive part of the farm field. So what I'm going to show you in the third dimension up is where's the highest value per acre? Where's the most productive parts of a city? And I, I start with Buffalo, New York. Buffalo, New York, uh, for those of you that have never been there, uh, has lost population every census since World War II. It's been a steady downward drip. Uh, they have suffered massive disinvestment in their downtown, in their core neighborhoods. Uh, you can go to Buffalo today and they will sell you a house for a dollar if you will live there for five years and improve it. Kind of like their homestead act. Um, I love Buffalo. It's a great place, but it's really, really uh, had a lot of decline. Yet when we step back and we say, where's the most productive parts of Buffalo, New York? Can you point to where the traditional downtown is? And not only is it a massive repository of wealth, but it absolutely dwarfs everything around it. We see this in cities of all sizes. Here's a smaller city of about 50,000 in upstate New York. Same kind of thing. Here's a small little town by where I live. 1,200 people, Crosby, Minnesota. When I first went here, they said, Chuck, we've got some great stuff happening out here. We've got some great stuff happening out here. But these neighborhoods here are just terrible. They really need a lot of work. We've got to figure out how to get some of this stuff torn down and rebuilt. And then we showed them where all their wealth was and all those poor neighborhoods where all those poor people live. This is a, a study we did in Lafayette, Louisiana. And by we, the maps I just showed you and this study, uh, I was part of a team uh, led by Urban3, a group out of Asheville, North Carolina. Joe Minicozzi is a really good friend of mine. Uh, he and I and some of his staff met with the city of Lafayette over the course of, of a couple of years. And the end result of that was this map here. Uh, the thing they were struggling with was they had this massive backlog of infrastructure maintenance that they had no chance of meeting. And every year the backlog grew far more than they could contribute to solving the problem. And they were being kind of pressured to raise taxes and do something to fix this. And their mayor, a, a really bright guy named Joey Durrell, said, I, I, don't, I don't think that's the right approach. I think we actually have to figure out what's wrong. And so what we did is we met with their staff. We dug through their records. Uh, we tried to figure out where they were spending their money and essentially how much things cost to, take care, to serve and maintain. And then we looked at where their money was coming from. And we were able to, through this analysis, uh, make that a parcel by parcel by parcel analysis. Uh, so what you are looking at here, in an accounting sense, everywhere you see a green property, uh, you're seeing a property that pays more and creates more revenue for the city than it causes in expense. And every place where you're seeing red, you're seeing a property that has more expense associated with it than it's going to create in revenue. In accounting terms, this is profit and loss. And the higher the line goes, the more the disparity is. So if it's very small, it's about break even. If it's very high, it's either very profitable or very much at a loss. Let me walk you through this map. There is a green spike right here. What is, what is that? That is a development called River Ranch. River Ranch uh, is a new urbanist development. And for those of you who don't know that term, uh, new urbanist development would be a development uh, built with traditional design approach, but with modern financing. So by traditional design, I'm talking about narrow streets, tight blocks, tight homes, uh, but everything built all at once to a finished state. Right now, it's brand new. And that illusion of wealth, it's doing really, really well, right? Um, it's an open question how it will do over time. Remember, we don't build things incrementally now. There's no, you know, build small, then the next phase, then the next phase. So what is going to happen here is what we see in 
modern development everywhere, where we build all at once to a finished state. 25 years at, from now, or 20 years from now at this point, uh, everybody's roof is going to fail at the same time. Everybody's driveway is going to go bad at the same time. Everybody's uh, siding will need to be replanted. Everybody's appliances, all this stuff is going to go bad at the same time. Without a renewal mechanism, in other words, without rising land values, you, you know, to, for people to invest and bring things up to the next level, What's going to happen? Sometimes these neighborhoods are maintained, but oftentimes what you see is that decline starts to creep in. One house, two house, three houses, and there's no renewal mechanism, so decline starts to set in and they go the, the wrong way. Right now, though, it's killing it. It's great. To the east of that is this big green area here. What is this? This is Lafayette's core downtown. Uh, Lafayette's core downtown, I would compare to my hometown, not yours, which is substantially nicer. Uh, Lafayette struggles, um, a lot of dive bars, it's a college town, you can go downtown and, you know, get a taco for a buck fifty, that's kind of the clientele. It's, uh, it is, it, they're working at it, it's not great. But financially, it's doing incredible, it's really doing great. There's a, a crescent of green through here. Uh, what is that? Those are the poor neighborhoods. Uh, those are the neighborhoods where when we went to get uh, an Airbnb house to set up shop in, uh, the city staff said, don't, don't go to that neighborhood. That's where the burglaries happen, the murders happen, the rapes happen. Stay, stay out of that neighborhood. That's the bad part of town. Uh, what's going on out here? Uh, this is all red out here. Uh, what is this? Uh, the mall, the big box stores, the strip malls, the drive through restaurants, the uh, housing subdivisions with the windy streets and the dead end cul-de-sacs. That's what that is out there. There's two subsidies displayed in this map. And they are universal to the American development pattern. Every place we have studied exhibits these same pair of subsidies. Subsidy number one, the poor neighborhoods subsidize the affluent neighborhoods. Subsidy number two, future generations are subsidizing today's generation. Uh, if you live in Lafayette, in the median house, you will pay $1,500 a year in taxes to the city. You'll pay other taxes to the school district and the region and the parish or whatever, but you pay $1,500 to the city. In order for the city to make good on every promise represented in this map, your taxes would need to go from $1,500 a year to $9,200 a year. One out of every $5 the median family makes in Lafayette would need to be spent just maintaining the infrastructure they have. That is never going to happen. And so what that means is that at some point in the future, and actually the future is now in some ways for them, but even more so as time goes on, Lafayette is going to have to decide what they maintain and what they let go. There is a model for this. There is a city that we have seen actually go through this in this country. Do you all know the city that I'm talking about? Detroit. Detroit. Yeah. It's very interesting because uh, if you go around and you talk to people about Detroit, uh, lots of people, people who have never been to Detroit uh, even, uh, have very strong opinions on what happened in Detroit. Uh, if you have a messed up right of center view of the world, or you have a messed up left of center view of the world, you can explain Detroit in your paradigm in a way that you're going to be comfortable with, right? It was uh, incompetent government. It was greedy auto companies. It was lazy unions. It was people not paying enough taxes. It was those people. Whatever your screwed up view of the world is, you can apply it to Detroit and be very smug about it. <laughs> I will give you my version of what has happened in Detroit. In the early 1900s, Detroit, the auto capital of the world, 
<coughs> embarked on this development pattern ahead of everybody else. When we got to the end of World War II and we were looking for a national model, who did we look to? We looked to Detroit. And we all copied what Detroit did. Detroit started this experiment 20 years earlier than everybody else. They simply arrived at the final destination 20 years ahead of everybody else. And you can write a backstory where you look at, you know, bad business decisions and bad investments that were made and, uh, you know, corrupt dealings on pension funds. And those are all narratives. Detroit became too fragile to recover from things that happen as a normal course of doing business in a city. And when we step back and we look at cities all over the country, including Lafayette, including Eau Claire, uh, what we see is the same underlying fundamentals. We have ahead of us a really difficult conversation about what we're going to keep and what we're not going to keep. And that is one that we are uh, ill-prepared culturally to have. When we think about this as a reflection of what cities around the US are like, really around North America, um, we start to think about what these buildings look like. Uh, these are in North Carolina. They could be here. They could be anywhere. These ratios are very much the same. Here's a Kmart at 384,000 an acre. Here's a Walmart at 967,000 an acre. When we go to the traditional downtown, here's an old warehouse that's been converted into a supper club, 5 million an acre. And here's my favorite, uh, Jimmy's Pizza, 3.4 million per acre. Now, pause for a second and ask yourselves, do, do we have the wherewithal? Do we have the sophistication? Do we have what it takes to build something as complex and refined as Jimmy's Pizza? <laughs> because if we do, and I think we have that set of skills here, right, at least, if we do, look at the wealth that we can start to build. When we look around at our communities, we look at all those gaps and all that room and all that space is just dying for investment. The place we start is not from the top down and try to build something huge that will you know, create cascading wealth. We get back to what we know works. Let's start making better use of what we have. Let's start with what we know works and let's scale up from there. We can build a generation of this kind of stuff and never fully tap everything we've built, not even come close to doing it. I'm going to uh, I put a little diversion into transportation in here, because I know there's some transportation people. And uh, I know one of the, the major issues that uh, you're having conversations with here revolve around transportation. Uh, I'm not going to go super in depth into this, but I, I do want to leave you with a, a couple things to think about. Um, this is something that we call a strode. Uh, a strode is a street road hybrid. You can think of this as the futon of transportation. Uh, <laughs> if, you, if you think of a futon as being an uncomfortable couch that makes into an uncomfortable bed, uh, this type of transportation improvement tries to do two things at once and fails at both of them. It tries to be both street and road. Uh, what's the difference? A road we can think of as a replacement of the railroad, which is what? A, a road on rails. And in a railroad, you would uh, get on at one spot, you would get off on another spot, and there's a high-speed connection between the two. We don't have frontage railroads. We don't have drive-through railroads. It's a high-speed connection between two places that people want to be. If you look at this, uh, we've made huge investments in order to make this a high-speed corridor, right? We put in four lanes. They're highway-scaled, wide lanes. We put in a center turn lane so that when the, uh, you know, 
cars are about to turn, they can get out of the way and the through traffic can speed right through. We have made massive investments to move cars quickly. Do cars get to move quickly here? No. no. Why? Because we have low speed limits. Uh, we have traffic signals that actually make you go zero for a period of time. And so even though we've made these huge investments in moving traffic, nobody moves quickly at all. What is a street? A street is, and always has been, a platform for building wealth. And when we look at this street, we can see that we have tried to do things to make it a more wealth producing type of environment. Uh, we put out decorative lights. They'll put out planters and benches and banners. We've <coughs> narrowed up some of the gaps to make it a little bit more walkable. Is this place producing a lot of wealth? No. Because if you're shopping here and you want to go over and shop here, no one's going to walk across seven lanes, right? No one's going to walk down here, wait for the light to turn, walk across. What are they going to do? They're going to get in their car. They're going to whip a U-turn and come around here. And the businesses all know this, so what have they done? They put in big parking lots. They put in drive throughs They've become more like that Taco John's than that old and blighted block. And what we see is that our tax base just continues to go down. This is a strode. It's the most expensive type of transportation investment we can make. It is the least productive type of environment we can build financially. It is the most dangerous kind of thing we can build. Yet it is the default way we go about constructing our places. If you are driving more than 25 miles an hour and less than 55 miles an hour, you are on a strode. Incidentally, um, after, a couple of years after this one was built, uh, the city uh, freaked out because people were speeding through here. I mean, <laughs> I wonder why, right? And so they came up with the idea of let's put out some signs because it's simply awareness that is you know, the problem here. Um, we have a, a saying at Strong Towns, if you need a sign to tell people to slow down, uh, you designed your street wrong. Streets. Uh, need to intuitively communicate to the driver uh, what we need them to do. And when we communicate to a driver that it is OK to drive fast, we give them wide lanes, recovery room, we clear out obstacles, we are cueing the driver that this is a very safe place for you to drive fast. And if that's not our intention, we're designing our streets incorrectly. What we really need to have a conversation with about transportation here in Wisconsin, in my home state of Minnesota, across the country, is not the conversation we're having, which is what? How do we get more money to continue to do the things we're doing now, right? That, that is such a bizarre conversation. What we're doing right now, we don't have enough money to do. Uh, it's not at working. So let's go find more money to continue to do this in ever bigger and more complicated ways. No, uh, what we actually have to do is start talking about how we build investments in transportation that are more productive. And the primary way that we are going to do this over the next generation is to take our strodes and convert them into either wealth producing streets or high productivity connections between productive places. We're going to make them either streets or roads. What I'm going to show you right now is how easy this is to do. Understanding that it's only easy from a technical design standpoint. Where this becomes impossible to do is culturally. Culturally, we have a real problem with this. Technically, easy to do. Culturally, nearly impossible. So you can see the problem we need to overcome is not a technical one. Let me show you what we do. If we want to go from strode to street, we have a nasty strode, and we want to make it a wealth producing street, what do we do? Well, we slow traffic. We prioritize people over automobiles. right? People create wealth. We want more people. Uh, we intensify our land use. We actually build and develop. That's how you get more wealth, is to build more stuff. Uh, 
And we embrace the fact that these are really complex, adaptable environments. We don't pretend we know everything about what's going to happen. We incrementally allow things to grow and happen, and we respond to that. If we want to go from street to or from strode to productive road, we want to really make this a great high-speed connection between places, it's the opposite. We actually limit access. All those turns onto our strodes, we, we close those down. Those have to come some other way. We want to move traffic. We don't want to slow things down. We actually uh, have automobiles have different space than walkers and bikers. You, you cannot safely walk or bike uh, four or five feet from traffic going 50 plus miles an hour. So there need to be separate facilities if we want biking and walking in these places. Uh, we don't allow the adjacent development to mine that collective transportation investment for short-term gain. Uh, we don't put accesses in so we get the Quickie Mart and the strip mall. We say no to that. This is an investment we made in moving people, and the value it provides is the connection from this place to this place. And then we simplify. These are not complex places. I want to show you that this cultural conversation is not as hard as you might think. Because we uh, all have a certain set of values that are very universal. And I've done this in groups with hundreds and hundreds of people uh, around the country. And I get the same kind of thing. So we'll, we'll see what happens here. There's a little bit higher level of, of technical professional here. So you might uh, have different sets of priorities. But we'll see. When engineers go out and make a transportation uh, project happen, uh, they will tell you that they're value free. They don't have any values that they're applying. Um, not recognizing that like value free is a value in and of itself is kind of a contradiction of terms. Um, but they'll tell you that, you know, we just use data and facts. We don't apply any values. Yet if you actually look at the design process, it is full of values. It prioritizes certain things over other things. Uh, for example, when an engineer goes out and designs a project, they will say, uh, what is the design speed for this project? They will then say, uh, what is the volume of traffic we're expected to handle? Given that speed and that traffic, they'll look in a manual and say, what does a safe design look like? And then they ask the question, how much does this cost? Those are the values embedded in the design process of the engineering profession when they go out and make transportation improvements. Here's what I want to ask you. I want to ask you what your values are. And I want you to actually shout this out. We're going to do it together. Uh, but I want you to think about the streets where you live, where you work, uh, I want you to think about places you would bring friends when they come to visit, places that you would want to go out and eat. I want you to think about the values that you would like applied to those places. And I want you to tell me which one is most important to you. Is it important to you that cars be able to travel at design speed? Is it important that we handle uh, expected volume of traffic? Is it important that the places we build be safe? Uh, or is it more important that we build things that are cost effective? So if you had to choose, please shout it out, would it be speed, volume, safety, or cost? Safety. 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 If you had to choose between moving cars at speed, moving a set volume of cars, or ensuring that our investments are cost effective, would you prioritize speed, volume, or cost? Cost. cost. Do you see what we're doing? I, I can't change these as we go. <laughs> If you had to choose between moving cars at speed or moving a set volume of cars, is it more important to you to move uh, a, a, a speed or a volume? Would you say speed or volume? Volume. Do you see what we did? We just inverted the values that are routinely applied to the places we live. We all understand 
at the end of the day that to make places safe, we need to sacrifice speed. We all understand that to make places productive, make our investments cost effective, that may mean compromise to our ability to move cars through. These are things we as collectively understand. <clears throat> These values are not being applied to the places we built. And our challenge as public officials, as people working on these projects, and also as citizens in these communities, is to ensure that our values are actually being applied to the things that we do. We are not powerless. How many of you have heard of the idea of a complete street? Almost all of you. Complete streets is a, a very rational response to a despotic world. If you are, are not, you, you, if, if that doesn't make sense to you, uh, if you're not used to walking or biking uh, through many different environments, I strongly encourage you to go out and try it. Um, it will open your eyes to how despotic the places that we have built actually are. Um, when you experience the world at 30 miles an hour, you have a very different relationship than when you experience the world at two miles an hour. The city feels different. It responds to you in a different way. It communicates different things to you. And at two miles an hour, our cities are very despotic. Complete Streets is an American attempt to overcome that. And I get it. I understand it. it, it, it by American, I mean it, this is very consistent with our values. Uh, we, sometimes we call this separate but equal, right? Everybody gets their place. Everybody gets something. Cars get their place. Parked cars get their place. Transit gets a place. Bikers get a place. Walkers get a place. Nobody has to compromise on what they have. Everybody just gets something, right? It's a very American approach. I want to draw a distinction for you that I want you to carry with you in your mind. Complete streets accommodate pedestrians in an environment dominated by automobiles. A strong town, in contrast, accommodates automobiles in an environment dominated by people. And I use the word people, not pedestrian, people. People are the indicator species of success. If you are trying to build a productive place, a place that generates enough wealth to actually sustain itself generation after generation after generation, when you go there, you'll know you're being successful if you see people. All those places that we've modeled, when we go to the places with the high spikes, what do we see there? People. People out walking around, people crossing the streets, people interacting. It's people that build wealth. They are the indicator species of success. And so when we build around them, uh, we are more apt to see things go in the right direction. Let me close with this. Um, there's a little street in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, I've, I've been fortunate enough to work with Memphis on a number of things. And Memphis has uh, struggled in the way that a lot of cities have struggled. Uh, but it's not from lack of trying, right? They did everything they were supposed to do. They ran the highway through the middle of the city. They ripped down buildings to build parking ramps and parking lots. They expanded outward and outward. They built a beltway. They kept going. They built a second beltway. They've done all the stuff they were supposed to do, yet prosperity has been very elusive. They show up on a lot of those lists that you don't want to be on, the kind that Detroit is always at the top of. You see Detroit, Memphis, Memphis, Detroit, homicides, poverty rates, out of wedlock births. But Memphis has seen a renaissance of sorts. And it's happened not because of anything. It's actually happened despite uh, things that have been done from the top down to try to create growth. They've been the wellspring of things that people have done uh, on their own. And this is a prime example. This is a little street called Broad Avenue. Broad Avenue was a streetcar stop. In the 1950s, the city ripped out the streetcar line. 
Uh, they ran a highway through the middle of the neighborhood. Without the streetcar stop, without the foot traffic from the neighborhood, this little set of stores just died. Not enough life to support them. Some neighbors, fed up with the decline, fed up with the neglect, took matters into their own hands. They went out. They worked with the property owners to get the buildings swept out. They swept up the sidewalks. They painted their own crosswalks. They painted their own bike lanes. They put out planters and flowers. For one weekend, they invited businesses from around the community to come in and open up and just show what this place could be. They didn't go get Department of Health inspections. They didn't go get city permission. They just went out and did it. And they said, by the time anybody gets mad and comes to shut us down, we're going to be gone anyway. Let's just go out and do it. <laughs> and this is not the greatest street in all of Memphis. But it's a heck of a lot better than what was there when they started. Now, I wasn't here when this project happened. But I was out there six months afterward. Six months afterward, every single storefront was occupied by a business. I talked to one of the landlords. He said he was able to charge double the amount what he was asking for before the project for the last place to go. The city has since gone out and documented 18 new businesses, 32 new jobs, $12 million of property value appreciation. Total public investment. Zero. That's a pretty high return. When we step back and we look at our cities, what we see is that the highest returning investments are really, really small. For decades, we have been so obsessed with chasing that dollar out on the edge, chasing after that big project that was going to make us rich, that what we have done is we have overlooked the pennies and the nickels and the dimes that are just waiting there to be picked up in our core neighborhoods. We took that neighborhood with the Taco John's and the Old and Blighted Block, and we spent a year in that neighborhood just observing where people struggle day after day. What kind of things were people having a hard time with? And our idea was we didn't have a lot of money, but if we could try to address those struggles, we could make this neighborhood a little bit better. And if we made the neighborhood a little bit better, more people would want to live there. And if more people wanted to live there, you would see property values start to slowly inch their way up. You would see people start to invest in the neighborhood. You'd see that virtuous cycle of incremental growth reignited. And so we went out and we saw the mom walking through the ditch, weeds up to her waist, pushing a stroller. What are you doing? I don't have a car today. I've got to go to the grocery store. It doesn't feel safe walking in the street, so I'm walking here. We saw the elderly woman uh, with a walker walking in the middle of the street, climbing over mounds of snow. What are, what are you doing? I have to get to the pharmacy today. I don't have a choice. The sidewalk is not shoveled, and there's no sidewalk once you get up here. So I have to walk here. We saw the kids walking through mud in the alleys instead of out on the street. What are you doing? Well, our mom told us that uh, we have to walk here because it's not safe to be out there. It's safer in the alley than it is out on the street. And so we started doing different things in this neighborhood. We started uh, putting in uh, crosswalks in tape and seeing how people reacted to it, seeing how the traffic reacted to it. Uh, we went out at 5 in the morning. Uh, we did a speed study once, and then we went out a week later at 5 in the morning and took chalk that you would chalk a base path with on a ball field and narrowed up the lanes, created some edge friction, put in some bike lanes, and watched that when we did the original study, Two out of three cars went over the speed limit. And after we put in the narrower lanes, only one out of 300 went above the speed limit. We started doing little tests like this. And at the end of it, we came up with this report called Neighborhoods First. Eight projects that the city could do in this neighborhood to make life a little bit better for the people that were there now, to address problems that we observed. Little things like put in a crosswalk here, put in a bike lane there, plant a row of trees. My city right now is finishing up a $14 million project to run sewer and water two miles out of town to build a business park out at the airport. We already have a business park we built in the 90s. It's only half full. But this one would be air-oriented, which we're convinced is going to have all kinds of special advantages, $14 million.
Our total annual budget, $9 million. So that gives you a, a sense of proportion. The total cost of our eight projects, $16,700. What happens if we go out and we spend $16,700 in a neighborhood doing small things and nothing gets better for anybody? Well, we're out $16,700. We can recover from that. We have learned eight things that don't work. Next year, let's go try eight other things. I have a sense, though, that the projects we recommended will work. You know, I, I went to the city engineer and I said, I think you could use a sidewalk here. <laughs> <laughs> you know what his response was? Why would you say that, Chuck? We will never identify the high return investments the way we go about it now. We will never understand what needs to be done in our cities by sitting behind a desk, by having a public meeting, by doing a visioning session with sticker charts on the walls. The way we are going to discover what needs to happen in our city is by going out and observing where people struggle and then asking ourselves a very simple question. What is the next smallest thing that we can do right now to address that struggle? And if we can do that in neighborhood after neighborhood, day after day, week after week, year after year, not only will we be making the highest returning investments that we can possibly make, we cannot help but improve people's lives in the process. Thank you so much. Here's our website, strongtowns.org. I'm going to tell you something right now uh, that a lot of people don't realize. Um, we have licensed all of our stuff on our site under a Creative Commons license. 